Hello, lords and ladies of the realm. It is I, Emily Sophia, here to break down for you guys the latest episode of Telltale Games Game of Thrones. So, we are on a nest of vipers, or in a nest of vipers, shall we say. So, spoiler alert before I dive into the mad thick of things, as I shall be bearing all about, well, of course, my experience with the game. To clarify, I play this with my brother. So technically, he's normally the one at the helm, and I am back, uh, backseat gaming. But <laughs> we have a good experience with it. It's a lot of fun. So yeah, if you're looking for a Let's Play video, you're not so much going to find that here. I'm just talking about the game, me and my brother's joint experience with it, and how we grappled with the insanities that ensued in this penultimate episode of the season. So let's do this thing. I, you know, time and time again, I am blown away by just how marvelously this game brings me into the Game of Thrones universe. I mean, it's been a little while since the pretty cataclysmic finale of the Game of Thrones show on HBO, and I was just going about my merry life trying not to relive the pains and agonies that I experienced in that episode. And this kind of transported me right back. Of course, it's at a different point in the canonical story. We're looking at different characters, but I have developed a bond that is just as strong with these characters as the bond that I share with some of the ones that I have known for forever. And I think that that is so important and so critical because the way that Telltale has gone about constructing this universe is they want, they want to bring these characters in that they can do whatever they want with while at once having them interact with all these other characters. And, you know, you kind of get these moments that, like, feel like fan service because you get to sort of be this vicarious character and make them interact with your favorite characters in the show. But at the same time, because they're trying to situate it in the context of what actually is going on in the show, they can't just go and kill off Ramsay Snow, for example. Which, I wish that that was an unknown factor. I so wish, because, like, the way that my brother and I have gone about dealing with Ramsay is pretty much the opposite. Because no matter what you do, if you try to incite him, you're gonna die. If you try to not incite him, he's going to make you feel belittled and small and punitive and depressed. That's just the way of it. <laughs> there is no way to win. And that was the epitome of a nest of vipers was there was no winning for anybody. Oh, this is still sticking in the frame here. I'm going to send you away. Anyhow, <laughs> so my brother and I, for like two hours after we finished the episode, were just ransacking our brains trying to figure out if what we did was correct. Now, I will be up front with you guys because this is the question of the hour. We ended up saving, at least in this playthrough, we ended up saving Roderick. And I must applaud the masterminds at Telltale for giving us that choice because Roderick and Asher, I think for a lot of people, are the favorite and most beloved characters. They're incredibly well developed. We get to spend a lot of time with both of them, even though they are on disparate parts of the Westerosi world. And so coming to a point where at last these two major leaders of House Forrester are reunited, it has to be under these horrific circumstances where you have no choice but to throw one of them under the bus and let the other go free and essentially be the one to lead House Forrester into whatever is to come with the White Hills and Boltons. But Oh, it sucked. It sucked. Like, I didn't see that conflict coming. I should have. I mean, I, I felt that particular brand of heart palpitation rising in my chest in those last five minutes, and we agonized over the choice. I mean, just absolutely at an utter stalemate, because how, how can you vilify one or the other? How can you raise one of those characters over the other with, with Asher and, um, and Roderick? Because unless you've just resigned in your mind to screw one of them over and you feel like it's okay to go forward with one of them as opposed to the other, 
then it's impossible. But of course, I think the way that the Telltale kind of constructs these games is they they allow you to become immersed in the characters. And so how can you choose between two people who you've tried to do the best for if that's what you want to do? Because I know people who play and just decide to screw over one character just for kicks and giggles, like just to see what happens in that corner of the universe, you know, it's it's very Game of Thrones-esque. <laughs> just kind of like, what happens if I put this person here and I make them say this thing to this guy and say, you know, all, all of the different dynamics. Um, I think as far as playing things fast and loose, it sounds like this is what a lot of people have done and my brother and I have done this as well. So Mira being stuck at King's Landing is just so asphyxiating. I'm not saying that I don't necessarily like that part of the story, it's just that the woman is in a freaking box and for some reason that box has been placed on a pedestal that everybody is looking at including Marjorie, including Tyrion, including Cersei. Of course, Tyrion is now in prison, and the only thing you can really do is make him slightly disappointed in you, but at the same time, Tyrion, he's a very complex character. And so, with all of those nuances, you would be hard-pressed to make Tyrion your actual enemy, because he kind of knows his way through the world of King's Landing in his family. And I don't think that he's necessarily going to just pick a fight with you. He more wants to impart wisdom to you and help you do the things that you want to do and not get yourself epically screwed over. I think that that's kind of Tyrion's role. But um, yeah, so I guess I'll go talk about the other characters before coming back around to what happened at the end of the episode for us. But yeah, so <laughs> Mira, we had her get a little bit pissed off at what's her face, the other friend, handmaiden, flower chick, whose name is totally oh Sarah, Sarah Flowers. So for no good reason, she's just like, well, you made such a scene back there after I got you into the thing for Toman's coronation, and I just don't think we can be friends anymore. And so it was really funny because we, well, we accidentally had her say something really snarky, like we thought it was going to not come across as strongly as it did, and then she got mad, and then we're like, oh, but be my friend, because, yeah, because we really have pissed off Marjorie. I think that pretty much whichever way the cookie crumbles, she's going to be mad at you, but definitely feeling the weight of her not liking Nira. <laughs> so it kind of sucks that Sarah's attempting to back off on your partnership, and technically you have the information that could screw up her engagement because you know that she's a bastard. So she best not mess with you. <laughs> but at this point, things are on a bit of an ambiguous note there. Uh, <laughs> I love the confrontation scene with Cersei because she is dancing all around the hidden invisible elephant of her utter loathing towards Marjorie. And so she's asking all these questions like, oh, you would lie to her? <laughs> and I was like, yes, sure, I do what I have to do. And so finally, we actually impressed Cersei. That's always exciting. I love having that like that reaction when you see that come on the upper left hand corner of your screen like so and so is impressed like mmm that's me I was just pointing two different directions <laughs> I don't know what's going on like oh uh, oh uh, oh uh, oh uh. <laughs> but it was quite satisfying to get her impressed with you good deal but at any rate so attempted to get information from Tyrion it did not work there I feel like that's another one of those situations where, yeah, you could either totally lie to him or be totally candid and then the guard's probably going to storm in on you and he's going to be like, well, good luck with your life and blah, blah, blah. So, I don't know. <laughs> I have no, well, actually, technically, Cersei has promised that she's going to take care of your problem with the guy and the army and all the stuff from the previous episode. So she's offering you some assistance if, you know, I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine situation. So is Mira going to be able to conjure up the names she needs in order to scratch Cersei's back? I don't know. It's just kind of funny how with Mira, they sort of have her... Whenever she's interacting with the big main characters from the show that are also in the game, they're having her like go after all these little tidbits of information and everything's kind of around the periphery of these 
big time events. So it's just kind of funny like how mundane it can see it can seem in the grand scope of things, but it's kind of fun. <laughs> it's fun and it's frustrating. That's actually one of the most stressful places to be is in King's Landing. I think that could be true of the people actually living there <laughs> and in the world of Westeros and Game of Thrones. I would say so. But yeah, so that's what's going on there. Let's take a trip now up to the far, far north where Garrod Tootle and his band of not so merry men and Sylvie the not man, woman, child, girl, uh, <laughs> are trying to figure out are they actually going to press on to the magical mystical grove. Which I I really like the way that they have rendered the the artwork and just the you know, the sheer atmosphere of being in in the north in the midst of the the ice and cold and snow and just the ragged scenery. I really dig that. I dig that environment. It's a nice change of pace from some of the other locales that you get to visit in Westeros and beyond. But yeah, so that was that was another story in which some of the choices that you make aren't huge. They had a lot of good fighting sequences in the episode, actually. I think it was a pretty good use of the quick time events and trying to, you know, whether you're fighting White Walkers or you're in one of the fighting pits in Marine as Asher trying to get these freed slaves on your side to come and fight alongside you or what have you. There's there's a lot of big moments from emotional highs to like action highs and yeah so I think that it was a very rich and diverse episode in terms of kind of the different feels that you get. Because while say nothing is necessarily exploding in your face in King's Landing right now, you're gonna get something elsewhere. <laughs> so that was, it was very exciting um, with the fight sequence or hunting freaking rabbits, or having a heart-to-heart -heart with Sylvie, or, you know, attempting to get your ex-crow brethren to not be pansies and to maybe journey with you into the great unknown. Uh, rest in peace, one guy who got dead. Um, I'm pretty sure that it happens either way. Finn. Finn. Yes, that's the one. But he was also the one who was just kind of arbitrarily like, well, like, uh, oh, that place probably isn't real. Anyway, he's just that, he's that, like, third party that's trying to be like, yeah, yeah, he said that, and like, yeah, I'm with that guy, and he just doesn't really have a, form, a, a formed opinion of the world, it seems like. So, adios to you, sir. Because I, like, it was his idea to come. So, if he's going to decide, like, halfway there that it doesn't matter and everything is fake and myth, that's on you, man. But yeah, so he, I'm pretty sure, dies either way. I feel okay about it. <laughs> there are other things to feel bad about, so I'm going to focus my sadness in those directions. But yeah, I, li I like Garen. I like his, his will to endure, to put to the past behind him and press into the future despite the uncertainties revolving around it. So ultimately, I think a lot of the choices you can make either get you into a better place with Sylvie to where she's kind of willing to join your cause and transport you to where you need to be, or she's going to be pissed. But either way, you guys pretty much have to take off because the, because the undead have arrived, and there you go. So that kind of like negates some of the choices that would seem bigger, like, oh, you could totally alienate Sylvie and she's going to banish you or start a fight or something. Ultimately, push comes to shove and you gotta go. But it's those different shades of the relationships that you develop, which will change depending on certain things you say. But yeah, we were able to get Garrett to go hunting and like shoot some rabbits and she's like, wow, you're so cool and I, let's, let's talk about our feelings and the people we've lost. <laughs> I guess that death and hunting for, for dinner is a good way to a girl's heart as far as the free folk go. Um, yeah, so let's shimmy on down to Marine actually, because that was an extremely exciting part of the game and lots of fun because there's so many, so many different ways it can go down. And you do have a big crossroads moment there too, um, when you go as Asher to the fighting pits 
and you're trying to attempt to figure out how to get these people to rally around your cause, to be a part of your thing, while at once validating their freedom and helping them to embrace that, but helping them to find a way to channel their natural killer war-born instincts. So it's a, it's a very interesting sort of game that you get to play. Um, and we actually let the, um, what was his name, Blood Song, I think was the name of the warrior that you go up against. We had him survive. <laughs> it was actually my idea. I was saying just kill him off because you get their respect. Like, we did not impress the crowd, but we're still able to get them all to show up as well as Blood Song before you and Beshka take off. But yeah, anyway, let's, we'll go back to, of course, the immediate aftermath of um, freeing the slaves and dethroning the masters in Marine. So we were able to speak to Danny's sense of pathos by telling her about, well, we, we, we were honest about the fact that, yeah, we killed the master. And that was the thing that happened, but Bashko is a slave. And I knew that that was going to resonate with her. And, like, right away she's like, oh, my apologies. So, okay, well, cool. And then, as it turns out, she can't spare her second sons. But she, you know, in invites you to, to go forward and gives you gold. And that can be a good thing for future purposes of life. <laughs> Good to have a little capital on your side. So we walked out with that, but admittedly, a little frustrated. I knew it wasn't going to be that easy, but Danny is a fair, a fair lady, a fair queen who knows her own ways and she's got some bigger fish to fry. So we were very lucky to walk away with our heads regardless. That's something that's worth celebrating at the end of the day. Um, something that I really loved about Asher's character throughout this episode was just the pure, unadulterated snark that you get from his faces. Like, when he's talking to Danny, I was like, dude, you need to humble your face. <laughs> like, even if the things that he's saying are like, okay, that that's good and all, he just had this, like, mm, yes. <laughs> got this, like, Robin Hood-style bravado at any given moment, but... That's something that also makes him endearing and that I'm going to miss if we decide to go forward with just Roderick. But yeah, so you go with Beshka, headbutt the beast, you get into the pits and you meet the crew and you ruffle some feathers and you, you go to town, go to town, have a little brawl, get to test out some different weapons, enjoy the queuing and eing your way to success. <laughs> if you're playing on PC, that is, we, we play PC, but... Yeah, that was really fun. Really fun. A lot of different ways it could go down. I was surprised at the sheer amount of banter that was going on in the fighting pits. Like, from what I've even seen in the show, it doesn't seem like a place for a lot of talk. But, of course, unless they just want you to, like, get carpal tunnel from trying to meet all the key commands and stuff, and you're just duking it out like crazy, I think it's more fun and entertaining for the player to get to have those little quips and you know, wordplay and stuff like that. So it was it was good and fun. We let the guy live and nobody was totally pissed or whatever else. Cause yeah, basically we did the whole thing of like, you know, you're you're free, you're free to do what you want, but like this is a this is a purpose that you can commit yourself to. If you want, you're free people. Do it. We're gonna have a good time. <laughs> so it was like, come party and then they did. So that was cool. Of course, things go horribly awry later on, but that's that's down the road. Also, can I just say that with Beshka and Asher have had such an incredible dynamic, one of my favorite relationships in the game so far. And it's so heartbreaking if you don't save Asher because, you know, he goes to tell her, like, dude, I, I can't do this. I can't stick around and she's like, I came here for you and just like the way her voice breaks, like incredible voice acting, really well done, made me hate myself a lot. So two thumbs up. <laughs> but yeah, so we go back to the land of Iron Wrath where wrath is being had and poured out upon all mankind. Thanks in great part to Ramsey who decides to off Lady Elena. It's not Elena. What is her name? Oh gosh, Elena is from the show. 
Dang it, what's the name of, so the lady who you can either be betrothed to as Roderick or you lose her hand in marriage because it doesn't pan out. Don't remember her name? It's got an L. I know that much. Um, but yeah, it's her brother who's on the chopping block. Can't really do much besides attempt to shield your sister from the horror and then he makes you look anyway. And yeah, doom and frustration and all that stuff. <laughs> but essentially, he wants to see whose house is going to survive. Is it going to be Lud's or is it going to be Roderick's? And it's, yeah, kind of Darwinian. May, may the best house win. Which is what's gonna happen in some way, for sure. But, um, yeah. Also, you get to find out who the freaking spy is. And in our playthrough, it was Sir Royland. Not Duncan. Sir Royland. And we killed him. Because we have had, we have played Roderick as so meek in the face of oppression and so incredibly humble. And the game just drives that and just bores that into your skull. Like everything that is directed at Roderick is like, you're so weak. You're half the man your father was and you're the this and that and every, you, you know. It just gets really personal after a while. I am quite frankly a little bit fed up with the way that the world has been treating Roderick and so thusly we decided to make an example of the guy even though he had information about Asher and his safety and whatever else it's like would I guess my question of course is if you decided not to kill the traitor was the information of any value did it give you any slight upper hands? Like, did the did the final ambush scene go down any differently? Because the way we figured it in the moment is like, okay, you spare this guy's life for one piece of information that you might not even really be able to take into consideration and plan on. Because pretty much if you kill the traitor, if you kill Sir Royland like we did, and then Roderick freaking throws his crutch in the fire like a born-again man. It was, ugh, that was so good. But yeah, like pretty much we just decided to go meet Asher at the coast. And I think that whatever you do, you're going to end up there. You're going to meet up and the difficult choice is going to come. But then if you, if you spare the traitor, everybody's like, dude, come on. This guy has been screwing us over in <laughs> blatant fashion. Well, not not super blatant, but to the point where you know that somebody's taking all your information and conveying it to other parties. It's like, no, no. House Forester has gotten just bashed up, down, and sideways. Why would you spare someone who epitomizes the near downfall of your house? Like, uh-uh, uh-uh, there's a standard. And so we drew the line in the sand said adios and dis dispatched the brother and then we headed to the doom and despair that made up the end of this episode but yeah do let me know what happened in that scene for you does it is it either duncan or sir Royland? like depending on your decisions way back at the beginning of the game like who you kind of put where and that's what i'm trying to think but yeah we sort of felt like let's let's go for honor over <laughs> i don't know logic because because then it's like, if you keep this guy alive, could he screw you over again? It just doesn't seem like a good idea. And he tells Roderick off like crazy, just like, you are like Satan's butt and nobody likes you. That's a far less eloquent uh, <laughs> way of describing that. But yeah, it just, no, no. Like, there is no point and nothing to be gained from sparing his life other than maybe a little nugget of information, which what can you even do about it? Who knows? But anyways, the only reason in the moment I felt marginally better about sparing Roderick is the fact that he has been so downtrodden this entire game. And everything in my heart is like, this guy deserves to be to be in a place of honor and to you know carry his his house and yet asher it's like he he still has a legitimate claim too and so it is the perfect crushing pivotal moment that i would expect from a game of this caliber from telltale from game of thrones i mean it's it's the marriage of heaven and heaven with a little taste of hell 
because it hurts because the stakes are high and you have to bid farewell to one of the most critical players in the game and deal with the emotional fallout of that so it's my hope and expectation that this is going to play out in a huge way in the final episode because it's like when you think about it as far as killing off major characters go all the lines have to be recorded twice more content has to be created so they don't have as much leeway earlier on in the seasons but things have been building and building and building getting to a point where they can make a lot of content and make a really fantastic finale which is what i'm banking on so yeah that's the gist of that but i i have been thinking about this all day so let me know your thoughts your happenings um yeah i'd love to hear about some of the choices that you have made these are some of ours and i'm i'm very impressed very pleased, <laughs> very destroyed on the inside, which is a sign of a job well done. So I tip my hat to you. Thank you so much for watching this review. I imagine that I'm going to be back with the final one. So yeah, y'all take care of yourselves. And as always, I'll be back before you know it.